smallpox. It was once believed that this disease could be defeated by repeatedly scratching people's arms with material from the sores of someone infected with smallpox, a procedure known as inoculation. Smallpox inoculation began in 1721 and was widely celebrated at its introduction as one of the greatest medical discoveries and a well-established fact in medical science. Despite being initially hailed as a completely harmless invention, inoculation had a 2-3% to fatality rate. Data from the London Bills of Mortality indicate that inoculation did not mitigate smallpox in any significant way. In fact, deaths from smallpox increased by 50% throughout the 1700s. Thus, the procedure was neither safe nor widely effective. Inoculation was eventually abolished in England and Ireland by an Act of Parliament in 1840, after being widely promoted and used for nearly 120 years. However, even after its abolition, medical texts continued to praise inoculation as one of the most remarkable and exciting medical interventions. Inoculation was eventually replaced by a slightly modified approach proposed by Edward Jenner, who used material from a cowpox sore instead of a smallpox sore. Initially called cowpoxing, it was soon rebranded as vaccination. On March 17, 1802, Jenner petitioned the House of Commons, asserting that vaccination was perfectly safe, provided lifelong protection, and would eradicate smallpox worldwide. That your petitioner, having discovered that a disease which occasionally exists in a particular form among cattle, known by the name of cowpox, admits of being inoculated, vaccinated, on the human frame, with the most perfect ease and safety, and is attended with the singularly beneficial effect of rendering through life the person so inoculated perfectly secure from the infection of smallpox. Vaccination has already checked the progress of smallpox, and from its nature must finally annihilate that dreadful disorder. Edward Jenner, March 17, 1802 a deep prevalent medical mythology rapidly took root almost immediately since vaccination's inception. Most today believe that Edward Jenner developed the first vaccine to prevent smallpox infections, and this success led to the global eradication of smallpox and the development of many more life-saving vaccines. Most believe the vaccine was safe and effective, a mantra repeatedly used for all vaccines since then. But in reality, the material used in a vaccine was never just from a cow, as legend holds. Instead, vaccination was essentially a brand name used to describe pus and blood from a variety of animals. Cows, horses, goats, pigs, sheep, mules, donkeys, buffaloes, rabbits, and humans, including corpses of those who died from smallpox, microbes, and chemicals scratched onto people with the intention of protecting them from smallpox. Not only did the vaccine material come from various sources, but it was also repeatedly transferred from person to person in a process known as arm-to-arm -arm vaccination. This method was used for a hundred years until it was outlawed in 1898. Conventional medicine of the time wholeheartedly embraced the idea of scraping a mystery brew of microbes and chemicals onto people as long as it was labeled pure lymph or vaccine. Any medical professionals who did not walk lockstep with the gold standards of the time were dismissed out of hand and ostracized, despite having many legitimate concerns about the safety and effectiveness of this highly invasive procedure. The following quotes, as well as hundreds of others, come from medical professionals who had dissenting opinions about the highly profitable orthodox view. By reading these quotes, you can judge their veracity and determine whether their criticisms were reasonable and legitimate and if they should have been, and still should be, heeded. The practice of vaccination is absurd, superfluous, and worse than useless. But as, in numerous instances, death has happened from smallpox after cowpox, and as cowpox produces other diseases, of which many cases have terminated in death, the practice is directly, positively, and extremely pernicious to society. And, as having been the medium of defrauding the public probably of millions of money, which never has been accounted for, and for which vaccinating adventurers have been scrambling and fighting in the name of philanthropy, I hold it to be an imposture, not simply disgraceful to science, pernicious to health and dangerous to life, but destructive to the morals of the faculty and injurious to the purses of the community.
Charles McLean, MD, 1810. It surely would be unreasonable to expect the public should continue their patronage and confidence when their safety is positively and confessedly in the greatest danger. And it would be downright madness to imagine they ought or will continue to adopt vaccination as a defence against smallpox when experience has proved that no one who trusts to that practice is protected or his life safe against the varialist epidemic, but must fly from it for safety. And more especially when even now, seven or eight of every hundred vaccinated cases have, for some years past, fallen a prey to smallpox, which exceeds 20 times the number that died from inoculation with smallpox. And also, as far as present experience goes, much above a half of all who have placed their security in vaccination have undergone an attack of smallpox, and that there is no security for anyone who has undergone vaccination as a protection against the varialist epidemic. Thomas Brown, Surgeon, Musselburgh, Scotland, 1842. The vaccine virus is a poison. As such, it penetrates all organic systems and infects them in such a way as to act repressively on the pox. It is neither antidote nor corrigent therapeutic, nor does it neutralize the smallpox, but only paralyzes the expansive power of a good constitution so that the disease has to fall back upon the mucous membrane. Nobody has the right to transplant such a mischievous poison compulsorily into the life of a child. Dr. John Epps, 25 years director of the Genarian Institute, London, England, had vaccinated about 120,000 people. London Vaccine Institute Report, 1863. I have recently dissected more than a dozen children whose deaths were caused by vaccination, and no smallpox, however black, could have left more hideous traces of its malignant sores, foul sloughing, hearts empty or congested with clots, than did some of these little victims. Shame. Indeed, scarcely a day elapses, but I am called upon to witness the sufferings of vaccinated children in the form of cerebral and gastric complications, persistent vomiting, bronchitis, diarrhoea, with pustules in the mouth or throat, pharynx, on the eyelids, and ulceration of the cornea, which remains opaque and may lead to blindness. William Heikerman, M.D., 40 years' experience as a doctor of medicine, 1879. Vaccination is a practice that causes a vast amount of disease and suffering. Its effects are far more terrible than the disease it is designed to prevent. No matter how pure the vaccine matter may appear to be, virus is left in the system, which will, sooner or later, be developed in scrofula or some other filthy disease. Were I to relate a few of the cases that have fallen under my observation of persons injured by this practice, vaccination, it would fill the mind with horror. J. R. Newton, M.D., Boston, Massachusetts, 1879. From experience, I have seen more evils result from vaccination than I ever saw result from smallpox. In the first place, I have seen direct fatal results from vaccination, in the second place, I have seen chronic, incurably chronic disease the result of vaccination and death after the lapse of many years. And in the third place, I have seen introduced into the system through vaccination diseases of a destructive character, especially syphilis. I was vaccinated when a boy and a few years afterwards, I took smallpox. I vaccinated my first four children. One of them died certainly from vaccination and another was never strong after he was vaccinated. I would rather be shot than have any one of my family vaccinated. John Legay Brereton, Esquire, MD, member of the Royal College of Surgeons, 1881. After 50 years experience, I arrived at the conclusion that vaccination was not only useless as a preventative, but dangerous. I declined the risk of vaccination and would not vaccinate my bitterest enemy. Thomas Brett, M.D., London, England, speech, April 17th, 1883. The positive injuries of vaccination to health and life have been so indelibly inscribed on the tables of record that they should stand as a warning before the eye of every man who raises his lancet for the purpose of rendering miserable the life of his fellow creature. Even the greatest enthusiast for the compulsory law cannot deny those dangers. 
The entire medical and social literature are full of facts that prove them. Therefore, as vaccination renders no protection against smallpox, but is dangerous to life and health. And as long as we have the means in cleanliness, pure air, and temperate habits to avoid smallpox, as well as any other epidemic disease, it is high time to abandon a measure filthy in its origin, deceiving in the service expected of it, and dangerous to life in its effects. Monsieur de Cher, M.D., 1883. It would thus appear that a large proportion of the vaccination now performed is in reality but a modified form of inoculation, having smallpox as its basis, and containing nothing of the Janarian method but the name. It is not cowpox, neither spontaneous nor inoculated from horse grease, but it is smallpox propagated from human beings, through calves, to human beings again. It will thus be seen what slight foundation the whole question of vaccinal virus rests. Millions of vaccinations are made every year, and nobody knows what they are made with. The whole process is a haphazard game with chance. Vaccination was accepted on the simple dictum of Jenner that it would stamp out smallpox. The medical profession of today buys its vaccinal virus of those who make merchandise of it on their simple dictum that it is the right thing to use. I compiled a list of upwards of a thousand instances of persons who had suffered permanent injury or death from vaccination. Of these, Nine have been personally known to me. George William Winterburn, Ph.D., M.D., 1886. We have at our command testimonies, scores of testimonies, proving beyond any possible doubt that men unvaccinated have nursed smallpox patients in hospitals at different times, for years, and never took the disease. While on the other hand, we have, with the dates and figures, the most positive proof that those who had been vaccinated vaccinated two and three times, took the disease when exposed, and died therefrom. These facts are undeniable. J. M. Peebles, M.D., Ph.D., 1913. Did you ever take the time to ask yourself the question, what is vaccination? Did you ever think of the thousands of innocent babes and children who have died from its effects? Did you ever stop to think of the thousands of children who have become seriously ill and crippled by it? Did you ever stop to think of the 20 or more million dollars that are invested by the vaccine manufacturers in the United States alone? Did you ever realize that many diseases of childhood are largely due to the debilitating effect of vaccination? Did you ever think of the many prominent physicians of all schools who are now more than ever before opposed to vaccination and who do not vaccinate their own children? Do you know that many eminent physicians, scientists, editors, scholars, bacteriologists, statisticians, and thinking people in general have condemned this vaccination bugaboo as productive of the gravest injuries. That vaccination never did protect, does not protect, and cannot protect one from smallpox. That many thousands of children have developed smallpox and other diseases after being vaccinated a number of times? These questions are very important ones to parents and all persons who are interested in health and human welfare. Simon Lewis Katzoff, Ph.D., M.D., 1920. Vaccination has never been anything but a delusion, maintained only by professional greed and a misunderstanding entirely to the physical health and needs of humanity. Once these rules are fully understood, no respectable physician will be guilty of practicing vaccination either on children or adults. Joe Shelby Riley, M.D., Ph.D., 1921. Please visit DissolvingIllusions.com for more information on the history of disease and vaccines.